This Twins and White Sox series is brought to you by the all-new Chrysler 200 with available all-wheel drive, America's import. This is the final game of the four-game series with Chicago. It's also the last game in a 10-game homestand here at Target Field for the Twins. In the AL Central, the Royals have won five straight games but still trail Detroit by five. The Twins will start a three-game series in Kansas City on Tuesday. Good afternoon from Target Field. I'm Marty Gellner. Today is Little Big League Day at the ballpark. The Twins are celebrating the 20th anniversary of that movie, which is about a 12-year-old boy who becomes the owner and manager of the Twins. It was filmed at the Metrodome. Today, in honor of that plot, the Twins have an honorary manager. His name is Ryan Lucian. He is from Lakeville. Ryan was born with a rare heart condition. He was chosen for this role by the Ronald McDonald House. The star of the movie, Luke Edwards, is also here, as is John Gordon, who is in the movie. Ryan told me yesterday that he is thrilled with this opportunity. Not many people, like, at all get to do this. I mean, it's right. it's really cool. I can, you know, go down in the clubhouse, meet garden hires, some of the players. It's just people don't get to do this, and it's, it's really, really awesome to go down there and, you know, kind of live the dream. Ryan got a tour of the clubhouse. He also will deliver the lineup cards today. He got to sit and watch batting practice from the dugout. It's been a pretty good couple of days for Ryan Lucian, the honorary manager for the Twins tonight. Also, it's Little Big League Day today. A special screening of the movie will happen after the final outs, about 15 minutes after the game today. Coming up, Oswaldo Arcia has two hits in his last three hits in his last two games. Roy and Dick will tell us if he is back on track next. Fox Sports North is presented by Menards. Save big money on all your home improvement needs at Menards. And by Jeep. Hurry in and get a great deal during the Jeep Summer Clearance event. Five weeks ago today, the Twins won a Sunday afternoon game in the hopes 
and they succeeded in doing so, sweeping the White Sox in a four game series. One of the highlights in a season that hasn't had nearly enough. This afternoon, the Twins hope to win a Sunday afternoon game to avoid being swept by the same team, the Chicago White Sox, hoping to sweep the Twins in a four game series in Minnesota for the first time. And a good Sunday afternoon to you from Target Field, Dick Bramer and Roy Smalley for the homestand and series finale. One thing that the White Sox have shown the Twins is that they've got a pretty good starting rotation and something the Twins are envious about. The Chicago starters have done very well on the road. They've done very well on the road, and that's the way to uh, move up the division. They're starting to uh, do that right now. We've seen the offense come along with the addition of Adam Eaton in the, the uh, leadoff spot and Abreu in the third spot. But what has really changed is how well the starters have pitched. And had they pitched this well all season, they would not have just have been getting out of the cellar deck. They pitched very, very well. The White Sox are in a state of transition as they are saying goodbye to the Paul Canerco area this year and uh, opening up the Jose Abreu era and the one constant 10 years ago or so and maybe for another five or so with the White Sox is their shortstop Alexei Ramirez who always seems to hurt the twins and one of my favorite players for so many reasons he's a very very good shortstop plays the game the right way plays it with a smile on his face but this young man can hit he gives you quality bats up there almost all the time he's got power 10 home runs already this year he's a 15 to 18 home run guy with 280 hitter but he's a tough out at the plate in big situations and he has always hurt the twins this series has been no different and so the twins are hoping that at some point they'll have Oswaldo Arce as one of the better players at his position and some signs of improvement perhaps for Arce in this uh, very tough homestand. Yeah he's gotten some hits he's hit some home runs but this is going to be baby steps of progress for Arce because he has a lot of swing mechanics changes that he's trying to work on with Tom Brunanski to get himself to be a consistent big league hitter and when you're trying to do it at this level that's very difficult seeing some signs of his able his being able to keep his head a little bit more still at the plate that has kept him on changeups like that from left handers much better another home run off a changeup of a, from a left hander very very good sign and last night, if you watch his hands, they go down, they oftentimes stay there, but look, he's trying to work them up so that he can stay above the baseball, and that resulted in a line drive double to uh, right center. Little, little baby steps, but we're starting to see Oswaldo Arcia start to get some consistency because he's got all the talent and all the strength in the world. It's a swing mechanics issue. Off day tomorrow for the Twins, and then a week-long road trip. They'd like to head into both the off day and the road trip with a win here this afternoon.
Toyota, let's go places. To find your nearest Toyota dealer and check out our current offers, visit buyatoyota.com. By Sanford Orthopedics and Sports Medicine, for the everyday competitor in all of us. And by McDonald's, where right now you can score a delicious, creamy McCafe iced coffee starting at just $1.59. Twins were looking forward to this homestand, hoping for minimum seven and three, maybe eight and two, and they would be doing. Uh, just the opposite of what has happened. They'd be climbing toward first place instead of falling farther behind. Johan Pino hoping to pitch a good one here today. As the Twins hope to salvage something out of this long homestand, the longest homestand of the year. Robin Ventura has seen his team win three in a row, and now the White Sox are where the Tampa Bay Rays were at the very beginning of this homestand for the Twins. They're re-emerging as a fringe contender. And unfortunately for the Twins, they weren't able to put that type of streak together. The Menards batting order for the White Sox. Adam Eaton, Alexei Ramirez, Jose Abreu, Adam Dunn, Diane Viciato, Connor Gillespie, Alejandro Diaz, Gordon Beckham, and Adrian Nieto. On the mound for the Twins, Johan Pino has really not pitched too badly. It's been a... Uh, Kind of uh, what we're used to. It's either really good or not so good, and that's kind of been the way the twin starting staff has been. He's going to try to move the ball around all over the strike zone here today, and stay out of the middle of the plate if he can. Northland Ford defense for the twins. Sam Full back in the lineup in left field. Danny Santana in center. Oswaldo Arcia in right. Luf Escobar, Dozier, Parmalee, the infielders with Eric Fryer. Getting the start behind the plate. And Adam Eaton standing in the box getting ready to get this game started. The last time that the White Sox swept a four game series from this franchise as a visiting team was when the team was in Washington, D.C., right after World War II, 1947. And they've come in, and as uh, Ron Gardenhire said, they haven't just beaten the Twins. They've dominated them in the first three games. Down and in, ball one to Eaton. Eaton, Ramirez, and Abreu in the first inning. Eaton's had quite an impact in this series with some timely hits. He's gotten on base, taking ball two. Three and zero. With Ramirez on deck. And a strike. Pino in his last start took the loss against the Indians. Didn't walk anybody. Walks have not been a problem. Never more than two in any one of his six prior starts. And he takes strike two. You know, like uh, most pitchers who don't throw the fastball 96 or 97 miles an hour, it's not really about control. It's, it, it's control within the strike zone. Flip foul over the Chicago dugout. So with Pino, like uh, uh, Kevin Correa, for example, it's not about, it's not control about whether you walk people. It's about whether you can throw the ball uh, somewhere, some quality pitch outside the middle of the plate. And a high fastball gets a swing and a miss one down. Nice comeback from uh, Pino from 3 0 oh to strike three. One down, and that'll bring up Ramirez. Got a little bit of help from Adam Eaton there. That ball probably out of the strike zone. It's certainly not a pitch that uh, Eaton wants to swing at. And so he gave uh, Pino a little bit of help there, but a nice comeback by Johan to not walk the leadoff hitter in the game. Never want to do that. Missing inside to Alexei Ramirez. Alexei squaring around, not really. 
because he wanted to bunt, but he just wanted to have a real good look. He'd never seen Johan Pino before. Let me get a good look at one pitch. Swing and a miss. This is Ramirez's seventh year with the White Sox. Signed through next year. And there's a club option on the other end of that. And strike two on the outside corner. It's amazing what a difference there is between for a hitter in terms of ease of putting the big end of the bat the ball between the middle of the plate and not too many inches either side of that. It, it, it's just so uh, it makes such a difference to be on the uh, one corner or the other as opposed to let's call it four or five inches in the middle of the plate. It's it, it it's I, I don't think baseball fans truly understand <laughs> appreciate the difference between the middle of the plate and the uh, and the corner. It's it's astonishing for a hitter. Foul back. Well if you took the width of the plate and divided it into thirds you can survive pitching to one third on one side and one third on the other. It's the third in the middle that gets you in trouble right. That's exactly right. That's well said that's 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 my point if they play to 70 17 since the plate is 17 inches wide. Not counting the black and the three inches off the burnt ones all the time. <laughs> Roller to short. Escobar fires across. Armily reaches out. Out number two. Nice play by Eduardo Escobar right there. Circling the ball with a strong, strong arm. Gets Ramirez. But to finish that thought, and you're absolutely right. 17 inch wide plate. And the six or seven inches in the middle is where you want it to not be. As you see, Escobar circle. And on the run for all over the top, which is unusual, but an awful lot of velocity on there. Jose Abreu, the batter. Just off the plate, ball one. That's the pitch right there that uh, got Ramirez to ground out to short. If he can throw that breaking ball right there, uh, he's going to have a nice, uh, nice outing today. That's a really good pitch. Exactly where he wants to throw. Fouled off a leg. You know, going back in history for the White Sox as Abreu is beginning what looks to be a pretty productive career from the right side of the plate. He's picking up the mantle from Paul Canerco. And then I suppose you could make the case that Canerco picked it up from a guy being enshrined today uh, in Cooperstown, Frank Thomas, going into the Baseball Hall of Fame. So the White Sox through that whole time have had a very strong powerful presence from the right side of the plate and there hasn't been a, a vacuum in between any of those guys. really really unusual occurrence isn't it they just they have found through three sort of generations of lineups a big strong right hand hitter in the middle of the lineup that is uh, able to hit the ball out of the ballpark and able to be a clutch hitter with men on base. Three and one to Abreu with Adam Dunn on deck. And a five pitch walk, putting Abreu aboard, getting Dunn to the plate with a man on. I'm not against that move right there at all. <laughs> Especially if the count goes to three and one. Don't give in to him throwing something that he can give you a quick one nothing uh, deficit. Just he can't. Uh, he he just can't beat you. And we, and we have learned that you can lose a ball game in the first inning. <laughs> yes. That, well, no. I mean you, you can't. And what I mean by that is you know you go up a three-run home run the other night to Abreu, and that was that was pretty much it. And there's no sense in you know we all talk about throwing strikes, but there are certain guys in certain lineups that you say I'm not going to let this guy get a quick run. I'm for the other team. I'm going to work on the next day. One strike, two done. Oh, speed pitch gets strike two. Adam Dunn can be pitched to. We know that he's got 107 strikeouts already. He he can hit the ball out of the ballpark. But you can strike him out. 
much more easily than a break. And he proved how easy it was on three pitches. Abreu left the board to score us top of the first. Garden hire uh, tending to uh, his uh, cuticles or something, hoping that his team can get out of this homestand with a win. A very important road trip coming up. We need to start playing competitive baseball again as soon as possible. The Menards batting order today: Danny Santana, Sam Full, Brian Dozier, Trevor Plouffe, Oswaldo Arcia, Josh Williams, Chris Parmalee, Eric Fryer, and then batting ninth Eduardo Escobar. Scott Carroll on the mound for the White Sox. We look at his numbers. The one thing that jumps out about uh, Carroll, actually, two things. The opponent batting average of 298 and 26 walks in the 73 and two thirds innings. So the Twins should have a chance to get some guys on the base pass today and run, as Ron Gardner likes to say, run around a little bit. They'd like this guy to do a lot of the running. Danny Santana. Average uh, trickling downward. His best game on this homestand was when he was batting ninth against the Indians on Wednesday. But the Twins envision him being a leadoff hitter. If this has become a developmental second half of the season, the Twins want Santana in the leadoff spot and get him accustomed to getting to know what it takes to be a leadoff hitter up here. Can't imagine a more unfortunate thing than for a rookie to come up, make this jump, and get hurt. Two and two. You're off to such a great start, hitting 350 or something like that, and running around, stealing bases, doubles, triples, home runs, and then hurt his knee very, very badly, missed 17 games. And that just it ruins the momentum. Now he's got to restart. Just off the plate. Close pitch taken for ball three. Well, he's been hurt twice. And they're both been rather odd injuries a bone bruise when he was running from first to second on a double. And then he had to miss some time when his helmet the bill of his helmet cut him over his eye. Flip foul. I mean those things. Usually don't happen to somebody in their early 20s to anybody but in case of the helmet injury. That helmet injury was one of the more uh, freakish type of injuries I've ever seen. And in uh, watching baseball all the years that I, that I have, the big, the big blow though was the 17 games right. with, with the knee. Uh, that just, that just short circuited everything. Ground ball to Ramirez. One down. Northland four defense for the White Sox. Same outfield that we've seen in all four games: the Aza, Eaton, Vicedo. Gillespie, Ramirez, Beckham, Abreu back together on the infield, and Adrian Nieto, a Rule 5 backup catcher that the White Sox are keeping this year, he'll give Tyler Flowers a break. And in the process, give the Twins a break because Flowers has been Chicago's hottest hitter. Sam Fold. 
There have been many times when we've seen Santana and Fold hitting back to back at the top of the lineup. We've seen them hit back to back ninth and first. All an attempt to try to get something going from this Twins lineup. Side one and one. Yeah, and I think that Ron Gardenhire's thinking is uh, get the the speed guys up there in front. Fold has been uh, really good at on base percentage, so get him up there. Get Danny Santana up in front of him, and move Ryan Dozier in the third spot. There's there really no reason not to try uh, Brian there at uh, in, in the third spot. He's leading the team in uh, home runs. He, May or may not turn out to be the Twins' best hitter for average, which is usually what you do with the uh, what you want in the third hitter. But he's got a chance to uh, give his club a uh, quick jolt with somebody on base. So let's try him. Two and two. Beautiful day, much cooler than it was last night when it climbed into the mid 80s. High temperature today, expected to be in the low 70s. Tapper right side and pass Beckham into short right field, and Fold thought about it, but he will hold up with a single. Ground ball hitting the right spot, and the uh, the good thing about this is Sam full speed. If uh, Beckham comes up with that, he may not be able to get him uh, anyway. But Sam's thinking about it. He's running hard all the way. Makes a quick decision that he's not going to get be able to make it to second base with one out. That's a good good decision not to gamble there. Give Brian Dozier a chance. See if the Twins gamble here with full at first, a base stealing possibility with Dozier at the plate. Fold on the very first pitch is safe. Beckham didn't catch the ball. Don't know whether he would have been safe had Beckham fielded the throw. But that I think Twins fans really enjoy seeing. They um, face it have nothing to lose here. Let's let's try to put the pedal to the metal and, and play the aggressor for a change. Well I'm sure Rod Gardner Gardenhire thinking I didn't put Danny Santana and Sam Fold in the one and two spot. Uh, for them not to run on the bases. We want to get something started. And he mentioned they're not a team that scores more than five or six runs. And so they got to manufacture them a little bit. Strike one to Dozier. Fold at second. Popped up left side. Easy catch for Ramirez. Two down. What the Twins have seen, not so much from the Indians, but certainly from the Rays, again here from the White Sox. When things are rolling, you get a lot of big two out hits. Of course, the Twins haven't done that well at all in this homestand. We'll see if Kluth can deliver one here. Unfortunately, a lot of the two out hits the Twins have gotten have been the first guy on that, you know, to get on that inning. And it's it's tough to string a bunch of hits together with with two outs. So runner in scoring position, two outs, see if Trevor can deliver here. Missing the inside corner. And that time hitting the corner with another off speed pitch. Got away with a high change up there. Not the uh, location that you'd want to throw a change up uh, up and in on the uh, on the plate. Now two and one. I believe this is the first time that Trevor Cliff has has seen Scott Carroll. Let know what that's against him. And so that's you, you see a guy a lot. You get a high change of chances are you're going to get have a pretty good swing. The first time you see it, maybe not. Popped up near second base. Beckham ends the inning. The Twins lead fold at second. No score.
Twins. I'm Marnie Gellner at Target Field. Joe Maurer has been out since July 2nd with an oblique injury. He will not make the upcoming trip to Kansas City and Chicago. This is our Sanford Health injury report. Maurer, though, will take some swings. He's scheduled to hit off the tee today, take batting practice in the cage tomorrow and Tuesday, and then hit on the field here at Target Field on Wednesday. And Ron Gardenhire said this morning that he expects by the time the Twins get back from their upcoming one-week road trip that Maurer should be on a rehab assignment. But Dick and Roy, that's if everything goes as scheduled for Maurer. Well, thank you, Marnie. And then Ron Gardenhire said the obvious: uh, the Twins lineup really misses Joe, and in uh, his absence, I think we're all we've all been reminded of that. As difficult as his season has been this year, he was uh, starting to pick up a couple hits a game, which is very common for him, having better at bats, and then the oblique injury. You just don't take a hitter of Joe's caliber out of a lineup, any lineup, and not uh, feel the uh, the difference. And and uh, we've been talking about the Twins' inability to score a lot of runs, but without Joe Mauer, it, around which the lineup really has been built. Ground ball to Trevor is a nice play to backhand. Man, Barbelly stepping into foul territory to make the catch one away. Nice footwork on the bag by Parmley. Good play all the way around. You see Trevor retreating on the ball to get that longer hop. That's the play that uh, Gillespie did not make the other the other night that we talked about. He retreated well, got the long hop. You have to be able to have a strong arm to, to play it that way, and he, he made a good throw, Parmley, with a good footwork around first base to go into foul territory, as you said, Dick, and make the play. If the Twins can get Connor Gillespie at, out, he's been uh, having quite a series here. Pino gets ahead of him. Gillespie has raised his batting average 10 points during this four game series. One of the few guys in baseball that does not wear batting gloves. Don't see that very often anymore. Two strikes. You were uh, always a batting glove guy or did you try it without? I did both but I I started uh, batting gloves and, and I've Stayed with the batting glove approach early on. Oh, and two. Half swing. Strike. Pino has his third of strikeout. Two down. Bring up Diaz. Music fans, check out Target Field like you've never seen it before. Head down to the ballpark. August. Eighth and ninth for the two night Skyline Music Festival. Friday is Indie Night featuring Andrew Bird and four other bands. And Saturday, Melissa Etheridge and OAR. Go to twinsbaseball.com for tickets and enjoy music at the ballpark during the 2014 Skyline Music Festival. Now, it was my assumption, and correct as many of mine are, that as soon as we're done playing baseball here, they're going to be converting the uh, Field here to the uh, stage and seating area for the Paul McCartney concert on Saturday, and that's not the case. As Marty said, Joe Maurer is going to stay back here and hit on the field in the middle of next week. So that conversion, unless as Gardy joke, Joe is going to be hitting the ball through the drum set out in center field. The conversion won't be till the uh, latter stages of the week, and I guess. Probably wouldn't take them more than a couple of days to set things up, but I just assumed that there'd be so much work to convert this from a baseball park to a concert hall that that would start right away. Two and one. Foul back. Two and two. I think groundskeeper Larry DeVito is more concerned with how quickly they can get it the heck off the field yeah, for us. That's probably he, true. He can get back to work. Well, uh, in that sense, uh, the baseball will be just an interference and not much more given the length of the of the homestand. Let's come home from this next road trip on a Sunday night, a day off Monday. To play a night game Tuesday, a day game Wednesday, and then it's off to the West Coast. It's as brief as a homestand can possibly be. 
It's only two games. And the second game is a day game. And then they'll have the music festival the next weekend. Two and two to Alejandro de Aza. Another foul. Pino made his major league debut against the White Sox back on June 19th. Seven innings, five hits, two earned runs. A no decision because as he left the game after seven innings, the game was tied at two. Twins went on to win that game, obviously, sweeping the White Sox. Got him. How about Johan Pino? A couple of hitless innings and four strikeouts along the way. You're watching the Twins and White Sox brought to you by the all new Chrysler 200. Big moments. There haven't been enough of them to be sure, but which moment is your favorite? Danny Santana's swing returning. Josh Willingham's late home run helping the Twins beat the Cleveland Indians. Home run coming in the eighth inning. Or Anthony Swarzak's solid spot start on a Wednesday afternoon picking up the win. Now the uh, two wins against the Indians, the only ones. For the Twins on this 10 game homestand, log on to Fox Sports North Facebook page to vote or tweet your pick with hashtag big moments on Twitter. Oswaldo Arcia takes a strike on the outside corner. Willingham will follow and then Parma. Strike two. See you gone on three pitches, one down. Bring up Willingham. Josh Willingham stepping into the box, the Ball of America scouting report on uh, Josh. Starting to see him get some hits to right field, hit the ball to center and right center a little bit, which to me makes me think he's starting to find his stroke, start seeing the ball a little bit better, waiting a little bit longer. That being the case, it could be that that home run swing that we desperately want to see not too far behind for Josh. Taking strike one. And now inside one on one. Watching Carroll pitch two pitchers today very, very similar. 
Carroll, a little sinking fastball around 89 or so. He got two breaking balls and a changeup. There's the change. Very, very similar to the kind of stuff and the way that Johan Pino wants to pitch as well. Move that sinker in and out. Show hitters two kinds and speeds of breaking ball and then throw change ups and fastball counts. Having a Willingham stance as he went through his swing, he lost his footing. Well, Carroll flipped up an 81 mile an hour change up there and, and uh, Josh saw a high change up and wanted to, wanted to kill it. Just wasn't, it was off the speed a little bit. Not out of his shoes, but out of his. Yeah, certainly track. out of his stance, yeah. 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 Two and two to Willingham. Harmony will follow. You see the speed range there from Scott Carroll. He has hit 91 on the, on the uh, fastball and thrown a very slow breaking ball at 79. Willingham cuts the through ball. a breaking ball. Yep. Two down. That's the 79 mile an hour breaking ball. Time now for you to tweet a photo using hashtag NorthFanPhoto for a chance to have it shown in an upcoming game broadcast brought to you by AT&T. Beautiful day here, and this number surprised me. This is uh, for the Twins game number 104. Almost half of them have been played in the daytime. This is the 48th day game. For the Twins, only the Cubs, 49, have played more. That's what I think is the amazing part of that uh, statistic. If you think of the uh, Cubs as being day game heavy in Wrigley Field, and the Twins right there with them. One and zero oh to Parmalee. Hooked into the corner, foul. You know, one of the reasons for that, and it doesn't apply on Sunday so much, but when a homestand or series ends during the week, the Twins are uh, very good about giving the uh, visiting team, or perhaps the Twins themselves, if they're leaving, play a day game to make it a little bit easier on the travel schedule for everybody. Here's a high fly to right field. VC8 back. Makes the catch in the shadows. One of the few times you'll see that catch made because of the overhang. And that ball couldn't have missed the limestone by more than a few inches. It's a one, two, three, second inning. Celebration of the 20th anniversary of the uh, baseball film Little Big League. Ryan Lucian was uh, named the honorary Twins manager. Was in the Twins dugout as the lineup was posted. And took the lineup card out to, uh, to the uh, home plate umpire Jeff Kellogg there. Johan Pino will uh, 
start the third inning pitching to Gordon Beckham and we're happy to have Luke Edwards who starred in that movie 20 years ago as a 12 year old owner of the twins now rather than have me try to summarize the plot of the movie Luke why don't you to give it a shot. <laughs> uh, well um, yeah I basically my character Billy Haywood inherits the team from, from his, the Jason Robards from character. Jason Robards my you know grandfather in the film um, and uh, we go through a little bit of a oh no oh, you're good pop fly uh, we, we go through uh, some struggles the team does and I decide to uh, fire the manager and appoint myself to do it. <laughs> why wouldn't you do that <laughs> that's a you know a natural thing to do for Absolutely. a 12 year old um, and uh, and we end up uh, winning some games and uh, you know uh, you know one of the players ends up uh, with my mom and uh, you know there's there's lots of adventures wacky fun so All right pretty good well now in the movie and and my son whom you met before the the game today uh, I ended up seeing the movie countless times it was one of his favorite movies growing up Yvonne Rodriguez was in it Mickey Tettleton. There's a strikeout, and Pino's already picked up five of those. Kevin Elster, Leon Bull Durham, Brad Leslie, Rafael Palmero, Lou Pinella, Randy Johnson, and Ken Griffey Jr. I mean, that's quite a star studded lineup. I mean, were you starstruck by these guys at all, or were you not much of a baseball fan? Well, yeah, uh, before the film, you know, I, I wasn't, I didn't follow baseball real closely, so I didn't, I didn't know who a lot of these guys were, and, you know, on set. Everybody is very awestruck, you know, and I'm kind of like, who, you know, who are these guys? Um, Griffey, of course, I, I knew because at the time he was, you know, probably the, the biggest. He was the man at that time. He was the man. Um, and by the way, you know, a super nice guy, uh, really an incredible guy. At, at one point I was doing an interview with um, local TV and he came up and he gave me the Shaving uh, right in the face, shaving cream pie in the face. <laughs> and you, from that, you thought he was a really nice guy. <laughs> you, you, you do have a good personality. <laughs> uh, so how much interaction did you have with the uh, with the big league players? Did you have a lot? Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, of course, you know, we were filming in the summer, uh, so you know, they it was during the season. So when they came in, they came in really quick, you know, and they would yeah. do their thing, do the scene. And then, you know, they're gone and, and like, you know, back on the road and stuff. Um, Griffey, for instance, um, you know, we did we did all of his material in one day, mm -hmm. you know, and it's all, you know, production. It's a long day. It's, like, right. you know, 14 hours. Um, but, you know, those guys, uh, they, they got packed schedules, you know, so they got to we got to get them in, get it done, get out of there. Well, I understand you got uh, top billing, but uh, you and I were in the movie together because uh, uh, the final scene, I believe it was the final scene when you come out and tip your cap, yeah. that was done right before a Twins game. That's and I funny. happened to be in the stands attending the game that no day. Kidding. Oh, yeah. And so uh, the cue was made by Bob Casey, the public address announcer, to now stand up and give uh, yeah. Billy a standing ovation. And, and I was one of the 40,000 people or whoever was there. Oh, so my I, did not, I don't think I got any. Uh, credits at all, even at the very end of the movie, very, very end of the credit roll, but I was there. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a you know a pretty amazing uh, memory. I was so nervous. Fouled back, and it was at the Metrodome. Of course, the most of the baseball scenes were shot uh, at the Metrodome. Have you gone by over there? It's 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 torn down now, and the new Viking uh, football stadium's going on. Right. There. Yeah, I've 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 seen the the you know what's left. Yeah. <laughs> Sort of, you know, uh, sad for us because we have a lot of great memories of, you know, playing around in there. That's exactly what Roy Smalley said the other night regarding the uh, demolition <laughs> right. of the Metrodome. That's right. Uh, you know, we were uh, part of the World Series there in '87. It's, it's sad to see that uh, big hole in the ground. That's for sure. Yeah. Let me ask you this question, uh, Luke. Aside from the big league players uh, that were uh, that were there. There were a lot of scenes that were pretty authentic baseball in terms of the kind of conversation that was being had with you and some of the uh, some of the players. And right. there, there we see the what's left of our um, oh, yeah. uh, of our beloved uh, World Series uh, ballpark uh, right now, which is going to be a spectacular Viking stadium. But I guess what I was wondering is, do you have uh, was there a uh, baseball uh, uh, advisor? 
on, on, on the uh, set? Uh, lots. Uh, a lot of them, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, well, we can talk about that, maybe. Yeah. Somebody, uh, a lot of a lot of pro players and, <laughs> and um, you know the screenwriters were huge yeah. baseball fans. So, yeah. Luke, great to see you. Thanks Hope so you've much. enjoyed your return to Minnesota. Yeah, really good. Thanks, guys. Good to see you. A lot of baseball's focus, of course, in Cooperstown, New York. The largest living induction class since 1971. Three managers and three players. Torrey, Cox, and LaRusso, the managers. Maddox, Glavin, teammate pitchers with the Braves for the bulk of their careers. And, of course, former Chicago slugger Frank Thomas. Eric Fryer will lead things off in the third for the Twins against Scott Carroll. And I told you I was going to bring this up, not because you're sitting next to me, and I'm certainly. Bobby Cox, Joe Torre, and Tony LaRusso uh, should be inducted into the Hall of Fame, but I've long felt that your uncle Gene Mock should be there as well. With 1,902 managerial wins, 2,037 losses, a winning percentage of 483, just three ticks below that of the all time winner. In Major League Baseball, Connie Mack, who managed forever and had a losing record in his career. But um, I just wanted to share that with the viewers that Gene Mock, who managed the Twins for a few years, uh, has credentials that posthumously, unfortunately, would, uh, I think, still warrant him getting into the Hall of Fame. Well, I really appreciate that, uh, Dick, very much. I think so, too, as, objective, as objectively as I, can, as I can be about it. But I. Know from firsthand that Gene managed an awful lot of teams without a whole lot of horses on the on the field, and and uh, taking nothing away from the guys that the managers that are in being inducted today, they are no doubters. Three of the best managers that ever ever managed ball clubs in the, in the major leagues. I kind of feel like Gene deserves to be there too. Tapper to the glove of Carroll it makes a nice jump and catch one down. Diamondbacks released a, an interesting tweet today that when they won the World Series in 2001, they beat those three managers in postseason play, <laughs> which is pretty interesting. They, they, they deserve to be in two of them. Cox, Larusa, and Torrey, and I think in that order, and they had to beat the Braves, the Cardinals, and the Yankees to win their first World Series. Impeccable numbers. You just, I found it interesting in, in looking. Uh, at LaRusso's numbers and because of his time with Oakland I guess of those three uh, Twins fans probably more familiar with Tony LaRusso than than the other two gentlemen. There's a drive to right hit hard off the bat of Escobar off the wall hard and running into second base and beating VC throw the number nine batter. 
the former White Sox infielder Eduardo Escobar with a one out double. Oh, nice at bat here by Escobar. Gets a ball right in the middle of the plate, and uh, finally, a, a Twins hitter gets a ball that he ought to drive, and, and it gets driven uh, off the uh, hard off the right field fence. But Escobar running hard all the way from first. His uh, former teammate having some fun with it, pushing him off the base there. Alexi Ramirez. There's Danny Santana hit a ground ball to short. Hits the outside corner. I think it's really interesting and kind of poignant that uh, the two of the guys that were maybe as responsible, back to the managers, as responsible for Bobby Cox winning the games that he, all the games that he won, are going in right. there with him, Glavin and, and Maddox. Santana lifts it high and deep to right. Viciato back. This one off the wall and it hits him and runs to the corner. Santana has two. He has three. And the Twins get the first run of the game. Almost identical to the drive off of Parmelee's bat that ended the second inning. And Viciato made such a nice play on that one for a visiting right fielder or any right fielder on Parmley's ball to stay with the fly ball that looked like it could hit a glance off of the limestone overhang there. This time he goes back and uh, is not able to make the play. He thought he could. Ball bounced off the wall and then and then hit him. That's a that's a difficult play for a right fielder because you don't know if that ball is going to glance off that limestone or not. Made a good play on the uh, on the first one and was a little bit confused, understandably so, by that one. And you should have seen Danny Santana run right from the right from home plate on that on that one. It was a no doubt triple because when the ball hit Viciato, he was almost to second base. Yeah. When I look back on in the infield, Santana was touching second, and Parmalee hadn't touched third yet. Or Escobar, yeah. Escobar, right. Right. One strike with the infield in. Sam Fold, the batter. Right at the second baseman. Two down. Santana hits this. Now watch him go. He sees that's going to be trouble, and he goes right now. He's he's off and running. He's got such a beautiful running style because it looks so effortless. Effortless. That's scampering around there much quicker than it looks like he's running. He has a little bit of a Rod Carew style right. when he when he runs. Very, very smooth and effortless. Here is Dozier. There's a bunt. Foul. Dozier surprising uh, the White Sox and I think even Santana trying to bunt the second run in. Gillespie was playing a deep third base. Not a bad idea. If the if third base is going to play you that deep with the runner on third, there's absolutely nothing uh, wrong with that. The thing that was wrong with that is my pet peeve about so many guys bunting for hits now, starting to run before they get the ball down. If you're going to be the guys playing you that deep, you do not have to run early. Fly ball center field should end the inning. A couple of extra base hits. The Twins play a little paddle ball against the right field wall and take a one nothing lead.
16 Ryder Cup. Minnesota, known as the top U.S. golf destination, has over 400 courses characterized by beautiful natural settings, a lot of water, excellent conditions, a lot of sand, affordability, and a lot of trees. <laughs> Visit exploreminnesota.com. Discover a world that's only in Minnesota. Tag your photos and experiences with hashtag only in MN. Ball, or, uh, foul ball, strike one. Now I know the three places where <laughs> you most hit the ball. <laughs> Ramirez hit a bouncer to short his first time up. First lead of the series for the Twins, and it's a, just a one nothing lead. But, you know, just a, an example here of what can happen. Ball hit to left, and it's hit deep. Going back is full at the wall, makes the catch. Ramirez nearly hit his third home run in the last three games. But an example of what can happen when the starting pitcher puts a few zeros up early. You got a chance to score first. Today's cold hard fact brought to you by Frost Brewed Coors Life. Most home runs by a rookie all time, Mark McGuire, in 1987, hit 49 of them. Wally Berger, Frank Robinson, who's in Cooperstown today for the induction, and then Albert Pujols, Rosen. Unless he gets hurt, it would seem a foregone conclusion that Abreu would get there with his major league leading 30 already before the end of July. 1 and 0. Oh. Popped up to the infield. Dozier will wait. And catch two down. There haven't been nearly enough wins in this homestand to satisfy the Twins or their fans, but you look at the wins that the Twins have gotten, and that therein lies the key to however many wins the Twins are going to get in the second half of the year. The scores of the wins have been four to three. Willingham with his eighth inning home run that led the Twins to the win, and then three to one. They got a well pinched ball game, managed to score just enough to win. And the two wins by a total of three runs. And when the Twins have had some good streaks this year, it's been that type of ball game. You see the Twins winning eight to five or nine to six. One strike and another pop up. Eric Fryer in foul ground. Tracking it, making the catch on the warning track. A one, two, three, four. Stay tuned for this important message from Mesh Pesher and Spence. Presented by the all-new Chrysler 200 with available all-wheel drive. America's import. One run on the board, but it seems like four because of what the Twins had to deal with last night. Chris Sale was outstanding. And remembering, of course, that Robin Ventura was a left-handed batter, but somebody asked him about facing Sale. 
And I thought Ventura came up with a very apt and accurate quote. He said, well, survival is your first thought. <laughs> with his delivery being so peculiar and so uh, dangerous, um, if one were to ever get away, and the guy throws 96 miles per hour, I just thought that was, for a left-handed batter in particular, survival is key to having a successful at bat. Just ask John Cruck against yes. Randy Johnson. Yes. <laughs> one and one to Plouffe. Sale being, his delivery being very reminiscent of uh, Randy Johnson. Sale's a lot more uh, elbows and arms and legs and than the big units, but from the side and real hard, both of them. Chopper headed up the middle, cut off by Ramirez, off balance throw, but enough on it to get Plouffe one down. He was outstanding and looked like he could have gone nine if they wanted him to. Yeah, three, as we say, plus plus pitches, fastball 96, 97, big slider, good changeup. And that funky delivery, the arms and legs, and throw from the side. Just, he's just a great pitcher. Much better uh, success rate for the Twins left-handed batters here today. The three hits have all come from lefties. They have a single, a double, a triple. Let's see if Arcia can complete the cycle here. One and zero. Oh. Strike called. RC has struck out swinging on three pitches his first time up. Strikeouts are bunching up again on RC. Struck out one out of every three times last year, and it's about the same rate this year. Swing and a miss, one and two. Striking out on four pitches this time. Set your compass due north Thursday nights on Fox Sports North. Join host Bill Shirk and Laura Shara as they take a look at the stories and adventures of outdoor enthusiasts in the upper Midwest. Due north outdoors Thursdays at 6 only on Fox Sports North. And then this Thursday, right after the game, we'll bring you the final game of the series in Kansas City. Let's leave. Monday night for a road trip that begins Tuesday night in Kansas City. Knocked down by Gillespie and no play. Willingham with a vicious one hop smash and went into and then out of the glove of the third baseman. Yeah, really good effort by uh, Gillespie. That ball was racked at it pretty well. Josh hit right on the button, a one hopper. Just too hard to stay in the glove as Gillespie was diving for it. Good effort, though. Chris Parmalee nearly hit one off the wall, nearly hit one off the limestone facing in right field. Viciedo made a, a nice catch on a ball that couldn't have missed the overhang by any more than a few inches. There's a Fastball stuck on the outside corner. You can see it sticks out more in right center field than it does closer to the line. One of the tricky things about right field here. Left field is pretty standard. Center field, there's a lot of room to run. The right field does bring some challenges to it. Not only with the overhang, but the different surfaces that uh, form the fence. Out there, you have limestone, you have a uh, harder surface below the limestone, you have the padding. This one hit to left center field. Running after it is Diaz, and he makes the catch on the edge of the track. On to the fifth. We're hanging on to a 1 0 lead.
Target Field in the Minnesota Lottery Winner Circle with $100 worth of scratch-off lottery tickets. This is Tim Crooks of Minneapolis, and he is 72 years young today. Happy birthday, Tim. What are you doing here to, special, to celebrate your special day besides the Twins game, of course? I don't really know. You don't know? Nobody bought you a cake yet? Oh, they probably will. After the ball game. Hopefully it's a go celebratory. Out go out to dinner. Go out to dinner, have some celebratory cake. Your birthday and a Twins win. How about yeah, that? That would be good. Happy birthday. Dick and, uh, Dick and Roy, we have 72 years old from Tim today, celebrating at Target Field. So far, so good. Thank you, Marnie. Twins have a one nothing lead. VC8 leading off the fifth, taking ball one. Driven foul. One and one. Viciato with a chopper to the backhand side of Trevor Plouffe. Plouffe made a nice play to throw him out. Parmalee made a nice play to take the throw in foul territory. And a low two and one. Boston leading Tampa Bay. Red Sox hoping to break Tampa Bay's nine game winning streak out of the break. Three and one. Twins were swept by the Rays. They haven't lost since they left town. Swing and a miss, three and two. Viciato, not the easiest guy to walk, but he has walked 22 times unintentionally in nearly 400 at bats. Gillespie and Diaz will follow. To center, where Santana waits. One down. Fly ball outs for Johan Pino. Carsoup.com trivia who was the last White Sox player to have four consecutive multi hit games against the Twins. We'll just go with uh, probably somebody in the ballpark, and I have no idea what the answer is, but I'm just going to say Robin Ventura. He was a very good hitter and might very well be the White Sox manager. Three in a row for Gillespie. Robin was a terrific hitter. It's a, that's a a good guess. He could string some multi hit games together. I know that. And uh, offered Frank Thomas an awful lot of protection, hitting behind Thomas for a good part of his career. And needed to be, they needed somebody behind Frank because the big hurt would take a walk. I mean, he walked over 100 times most every year in his career. They needed they needed guys behind Frank Thomas to uh, to pick up some runs as well. Frank got a lot of them, but he was a very very selective hitter, and he swung at balls that he wanted to swing at, or else he was he was willing to take a walk. And it's what part of what made him a great hitter. But they also needed some guys behind him. Popped up, fouling out of play. It was uh, my great pleasure. At the other side of downtown at the Metrodome to announce Thomas's 500th home run. A great player. I never saw a guy that big though that had such a small strike zone. Yeah, he was he was very selective, and he was one of those guys that the, his reputation got around the league with umpires. Popped up, back, and out of play. A lot of Twins hearts when he was with the White Sox really devastated the Twins in a playoff series. In uh, 2006, I believe, against the A's, he and Marco Scudero for the Oakland A's. One and two to Connor Gillespie. Now two and two.
16 outs on the board. 65 pitches thrown for Pino. Just off the corner, and it's three and two. The only Chicago base runner back in the first inning, Abreu drew a two out walk. Change up, flip back to the screen. Gillespie, not an easy guy to walk. Nearly 300 at bats and 23 unintentional walks. A couple of two strike fouls here. That's a good call. Pitch. Third strike. He came back inside and caught the corner. Yes, he did. That's a terrific pitch. Gillespie didn't like it. Ball might have been inside, but it's such a good, good strategy, good attempt, good execution. Went away with changeups. Came in. Fox Tracks has it just, just off the plate. Gillespie didn't like it, but that's that's terrific execution by Pino and Fryer. Really had him set up for an inside fastball. Able to deliver. Alejandro Deaza. Strike one. Deaza went down on strikes. Gillespie's strikeout is uh, Pino's first since Beckham strike out in the third. To right and a base hit. First Chicago hit comes with two outs in the fifth. Fans acknowledging that uh, in the fifth inning, this is the first hit for the other guys. I'm giving Pino a nice round of applause. Frank Thomas inducted into the Hall of Fame, or will be shortly. 301 career average, 19 seasons. Well, we've talked about guys that can hit the ball out of the ballpark to all fields, and what an advantage that is when you're that big and strong. And have good hitting mechanics like he did. Hard to get him in a hurry because he knew he could hit the ball out to right field, so he wasn't uh, vulnerable to breaking pitches. He had a great eye, so the breaking pitches he did swing at were almost always seemed like they were always hanging breaking balls, or else he wouldn't swing, and the umpires would call it a ball. He he dominated the batter's box. I think he dominated pitchers and catchers and umpires when he stood in there. Now there were a lot of physically big hitters during his era. The difference is Frank was that big or close to it when he came out of Auburn. He just was a big man. And I remember his uh, speech after his 500th home run at the Metrodome. He said, you know, I'm really proud of this because I did this the right way. He was blessed with tremendous size and strength and was never suspected of doing anything other than being a big strong guy who could mash the baseball and had a discerning eye at the plate. One and one to Gordon Beckham. Runner goes. Friars throw right on a bag. Got him. Easily. Great throw by Eric Fryer to cut down Daza for the third out. You're watching the Twins and White Sox brought to you by the all new Chrysler 200.
see fans of the game enjoying a beautiful Sunday afternoon here at the ballpark. I've said this before, Roy, and I don't know how you felt as a player, but I always felt, and still do, a special feeling uh, at a ballpark on a Sunday afternoon. And I, and I don't know why that is, but th to me there's something special about watching baseball on a Sunday. Was that the way that way for you or was it just a, no, another it, day game? It, no, absolutely uh, that way for me. I, I think uh, it, it's because in the era that, in which you and I uh, grew up in in the game there were you know so many night games. Ooh. Over the mound Beckham backhands and Fryer thrown out good play by Gordon Beckham one away. Very good play by uh, Beckham getting to the ball and then getting a lot on the throw to get Eric Fryer at first base. We'll look at it again, but one hopper right back over the mound. This looked like it could be a base hit. Beckham cuts it off, gets a lot on the throw to get fired. But yeah, I uh, I loved it. Sunday day games. There were a lot of a lot of night games, and in, in uh, when you and I were playing and watching baseball, and so a Sunday afternoon game kind of. Harken back to the old days of uh, that when baseball was played so much of the time in the day game. And you remember when we were kids and it, it, there wasn't the TV coverage that a lot of games you see would be the Saturday Yankee games with Mel Allen is you know doing the announcing and and that just seemed like baseball didn't it. Yeah it was a Saturday game of the week and then I know you know back when I was a kid growing up in Minnesota there were 50 games shown on television and always the road games on Sunday were. That was kind of the thing to do, at least for me. I I would much rather stay inside and watch baseball on TV in a Sunday afternoon than go out and play it. I was better watcher than player anyway. <laughs> the ball flipped down the line. That might be trouble. Escobar drops one in foul territory. And I think too for me, because I grew up in a very small town in western Minnesota, the routine was on Sunday you got up and went to church and the, the town team field was uh, take a look at Escobar's uh, swing at this pitch about a foot outside. The town team field was right behind our church in Dumont. And so you got out of church and then I I helped chalk the field sometimes. The town team was playing at one o'clock on Sunday afternoons and and that was the big social event in small town America in the late 50s early 60s. Escobar on a one hop uh, ground ball to Beckham is retired two down. Back to Santana. Group outings at Target Field, a great way to have fun with your church, school, co workers, and more. Groups of 25 or more qualify for special ticket discounts and can reserve certain seats without a deposit. Organize your group outing at Target Field by going to twinsbaseball.com slash groups or call 800 33 Twins. Two down on the fifth. Scott Carroll's been really good. He happened to give up back to back extra base hits in the third. But the only run scored so far. The second extra base hit Santana's triple off the fence in right field. One strike. The ground ball to Beckham. All three assists in the inning go to the Chicago second baseman. We'll move to the sixth.
200 with available all wheel drive. America's import. Here in Minneapolis, Twins are leading one to nothing. In Cooperstown, Frank Thomas is delivering his acceptance speech and his induction into the Baseball Hall of Fame. Tony La Russa just completed his a few moments ago. Gordon Beckham at the plate to start the inning, and he takes ball one. He was at the plate when Deaza was thrown out trying to steal. That wrapped up the fifth. Just missing low again. I guess when we've seen Pino miss today, he's missed generally low and not high, which might explain why the Twins lead one to nothing. That's exactly right. I was just thinking the same thing. And to go along with that, when he's had to make a pitch to come back three and one or three and two, it generally has not been in the middle of the plate, although that one was one of the first times he's done that. It'll be a double for Beckham leading off the sixth. Pino's had a lot of situations where he really needed to throw a strike and was able to throw a quality strike on the uh, outside the middle of the plate. And that time he got behind Beckham and had to come in there, got most of the middle of the zone, and Beckham able to hit it off the left field wall for a double. Trying run at second, nobody out. The number nine batter, Adrian Nieto. Twins are pinching the corners in the infield, anticipating a bunt attempt. Nieto with just 75 at bats on the year. 0 for 1 today. Showing no hint of bunting. He does have one sacrifice bunt on the year. The way the White Sox have been swinging the bat, it would it would surprise me if Robin Ventura put the bunt sign uh, here. It's still only the sixth inning to give the. Young man, a chance to hit the ball to the right side by swinging. Chop foul. You see, he's trying to do that, get the runner over from second to third by hitting to the right side. He's pretty sure that Ventura would give him at least one opportunity. Now, he could put the bunt on here. I'm sure the White Sox do it too. Most teams do. They'll give on the sign, just get him over. It's, right. a, you know, it's up to you. However, you feel yeah. you can do it. Just make sure that by the end of your at bat, the runners at least at third base. And there really ought not to be a sign of right. Have to be a sign. I mean, you should know. There's the bunt. And Pino lobs the ball to first. Beckham goes to third. So one swing and then a nice sacrifice bunt. And the tying runs at third with one out. Very good bunt there, and Nieto getting it uh, done the way we kind of thought it would with. Ventura giving him one strike to get the uh, runner over to third by swinging and when that didn't work then okay now just go ahead and I'm going to ask you to bunt to get him over. Twins will bring the infield in here for Adam Eaton. Twins uh, defensively in the same situation the White Sox were in after Santana's triple in the third. Missing low. In the third inning with one out, Escobar doubled, Santana tripled, still only one out. The White Sox brought the infield in, and Fold hit a ground ball right at Beckham. That's what the Twins are hoping Eaton will do here hit a ground ball right at Dozier and keep the runner at third base. I really think you have to come in on this guy in this situation, too. It's 2 0. Oh. Eaton's a slap hitter anytime he's up there, hits the ball. Most of the time from the center of the diamond around the left field and with a runner on third and one out. He's got in his mind. That he really wants to get something out over the plate and, and uh, stay in the middle of the field. He's got a lot of holes with the infield and you just have to get the ball out over the plate. And knock it by the infielders. That's why I think you need to come in. See that pitch right there. Nice pickup by Parmalee and he will go to the bag. Not in time. Great hustle by Eaton after a great pickup by Parmalee. First and third, one out. And Johan Pino making a very, very bad mistake here. He was spectating instead of getting over to do his job covering first. You can see Parmalee makes a great play, and Johan Pino nowhere near first base to cover to give Parmalee another option after he gets up off the ground. Terrific stop. Checks the plate. Runner's not going. Now he's got to get to first before Ooh. Eaton does. Ron Gardenhire coming out. They're going to take a look at this because it appeared on that replay 
that Parmalee's toe hit the bag before Eaton's hand did. Gary Steinbach handling this in Paul Molitor's absence. Boy, from that angle, it's hard. Maybe this angle. It looks like maybe he might have just gotten him, but I, I the, on the field it was called safe. I don't know that there's evidence to to overturn it. We'll see. Looked to me like he was out. Just barely. Yeah, I think he's safe. Yeah. Yep. On that replay, it looked like he was saying. Well, I definitely don't think we, it, when it's that close. I, Boy, and then I look yeah, at that one. Yeah. I just don't think they can overturn it based on that evidence. But we'll see. We'll see what they do. I, th I actually think he's. I think he's out. Yeah. As, as soon as Eaton's left hand hits the bag, it pops up. Well, it hits the. I, what I, the reason I think he's out is because I think his his hand hit the ground and popped up over the base. Oh, okay. And and he didn't get it back down before Parmley's toe hit the bag. That's that's why I think that he's out. But you know we have the we're looking at it at the views that the umpires are looking at, and it's going to be very very difficult I think for them to overturn it just because it, I think if he was ruled out on the field it would stay that way since it's ruled safe on the field I think it's going to stay that way we'll see in the meantime Pino not being over there is a it, covering first is a mistake safe well, the twins lose their challenge it'll be first and third one out and Ramirez will hit with the tying run still at third. Talk I've talked before about an infielder's internal clock about who's running at the, uh, at the hitter who the hitter is and how fast he is and you generally think about that out in the middle of the infield ground balls hit out there you kind of know how how quick you have to get quickly you have to get rid of the ball. And I know that when Chris made that great diving stop right there and came up and checked home, he wasn't thinking about Adam Eaton getting down the line as fast as Eaton can can do that. Well, you had to look at the runner at had third to, absolutely. because uh, that's why you brought the infield in. To absolutely. It. We'll see if Ramirez and hit into a ground ball double play. Napper foul. Ramirez has bounced into a. Not a team uh, high, but uh, second on the team, he's grounded into 14 double plays. One strike. So often you see good hitters with a high grounded in double play stat. Guys put the ball in play a lot. They get up. They're good hitters, so they're up with guys on base by design by the manager. This one hit to right center field. Arcia will make the catch. The game will be tied with Beckham tagging and scoring. When you see somebody like Ramirez who can run pretty well, when he's hit into a lot of ground balls, that tells me he's hitting the ball pretty hard. Right, and that's the. I guess that was uh, part of my point there about good hitters do, hitting in the double plays a lot because they get up with guys on base, they put the ball in play, and when they're putting the ball in play, they're hitting it hard. Here is Abreu. Abreu on the day, a walk in the first inning, and he popped up to Dozier in the fourth. And here's another situation where I think you throw the ball on the corners, either fastballs in. On the corner or off the or missing off the plate, you throw breaking balls down and on the corner or off the plate. And if you walk him, you walk him. You let him get himself out, or you go after Adam Dunn, where, the, where a guy that you know you can get out. Inside. Right there. Yep. Just stay in there. Hope he jams himself. Come back outside on the corner. Throw breaking balls down and away. Hope he rolls over the top of one. And if if you have to pitch to Adam Dunn 
in a one in a tie game here in the sixth inning with two guys on so be it you have you have more weapons to get Adam Dunn out than in the strike zone than you do this guy. Two and oh. And at this point with the count two and oh the, I think the chances of Eaton taking off for second are minimal. Because all it would do is open up first base for a probable intentional walk. White Sox have tied it here in the sixth, threatening to take the lead with two down. Fox Tracks presented by Jeep. Up high, and he's missed inside by a foot, outside by eight inches, and now high by about eight inches. And that's okay. I think that's I think that's the way you got to uh, you got to approach this at bat. And you're right, Dick Eaton was not absolutely not going anywhere. This at bat, this guy's in scoring position when he walks to the plate. So there's no no real reason to take the bat out of his hands by getting a stolen base. Foul back. If it appears to you at home that this guy looks like he's been here for six years or so, it might be because. He is 27 years old. As little as we know about him, he uh, played uh, in Cuba for 10 years. And Under great competition, against great competition. Right. Down the line, Eaton rounding second, on his way to third, and Eaton will be waved around, and the White Sox will take. A two to one lead on a two out double by Abreu. Well, I just think that's a mistake. I mean, you get to three and one and you try to fool him with something and throw a uh, hanging break ball right in the middle of the plate. Looked like he threw a little slider or something. Yeah, I mean, I. I don't know how other way to put it. I like the way they were going at him when they were throwing the balls off the plate and hoping he got himself out. There's absolutely no, no future in throwing a breaking ball strike three and one to Jose Abreu right there with in a tie ball game. In the center. Twins took a lead in the third. Now the White Sox take a lead in the sixth. Quick trip to the mound by Rick Anderson. Out there, and it might uh, be exactly about what you're talking about. Why throw him a strike when you've all but intentionally walked him and not come close to throwing a strike? I, that's, I guarantee you, that's what that frustration is all about. I mean, the man has 78 RBIs coming into this game. Adam Dunn hitting behind him has 15 home runs, but 42 RBIs. So if you keep this guy in the ballpark, you're going to get him out. Strike one, and that's what this trip to this mound is all about, too. Don't make matters worse now by making a big mistake to Adam Dunn. Just off the plate, one and one. Adam Dunn's career has been defined by making, uh, by Hitting long and many home runs off mistakes that pitchers make and striking out against the tough pitches that they, they make. You can get this guy out. Abreu immediately looked like he was going to be such a tougher out. Bounce to the right side and from short right field, Dozier ends the inning. But in the inning, a pair of doubles on a pair of Chicago runs.
Twins Baseball on Fox Sports North is presented by Century Link, your link to what's next. By Northland Ford. Visit NorthlandFord.com and your local Northland Ford dealers today. And by Grand Casino. The best stories start here. Comeback time again for the Twins. Sam Fold will lead things off. At the bottom of the sixth inning, Johan Pino sailing along through five innings, but the White Sox got a couple in the sixth. It'll be Fold, Dozier, and Plouffe. Twins middle of the lineup has done nothing. And we'll see if they can get something done third time through the lineup against Scott Carroll. Strike one. Fold with a single, and then the biggest at bat Fold's had so far came in the third inning. Twins had gotten a one out double from Escobar, a one out triple from Santana, had scored the first run. Runner at third, one out. White Sox brought the infield in and Fold bounced out to Beckham and did not get the runner in and for that matter neither did Dozier hitting behind him two and one. Yeah that was a big at bat he had a chance to uh, get it. The lead to two runs. A shower started to fall here. It's been getting darker. Over the last 15 minutes or so but we expect this to be just a brief. Cleansing shower. Easy for us to say because we have a roof over our head where we sit. Some folks are scattering, but I think everybody realizes this is going to last maybe just a couple of minutes. Three and one. And ball four. Well, let's take a lead off walk. You can get some base runners here, maybe putting together an inning against uh, Scott Carroll and now Dozier. Where do you think? Whenever this happens, let's hope it's next year when the Twins are competitive again. Where do you think Brian Dozier should hit? He's hit leadoff. He's hit second. He's hit third. I think he's even hit cleanup once. Yeah, I think he's. A, I think he's a second hitter. Okay. And why? Well, he has the ability to uh, get on base and score a lot of runs. He has the uh, what you want in a table setter type guy first or second. I don't think he's your prototypical leadoff hitter but I think he can be a terrific. He can learn to be a terrific second hitter because he already already has attributes that would make him really good there scores a lot of runs hits the ball out of the ballpark. Can have tough at bats with guys on base which which is going to happen for a second hitter in the American League. When the lineup turns over and you get your eighth or ninth hitter on and your leadoff hitter gets on now you got a chance to have a big inning with your second hitter. Rain coming down a little bit harder now. Full took off in the first inning on his first pitch. This is going to be a tough play. And Carroll picks up a wet baseball and throws Dozier out. A swinging bunt getting Sam Full to second. I thought for a moment that with a wet baseball and all that would be a tough play for Carroll to make, but he made it. I think it was a tough play. I think he thought it was going to be tough. He picked it up with his, looked like with his whole hand and threw it with his uh, with his whole hand. You see, him, he'll pick it up. He grabs the whole thing and throws kind of a grenade over there. But uh, because he was expecting to be wet, I think threw a palm ball, and, but got the job done. Nine run at second, one down. The White Sox got some uh, clutch at bats in the top of this inning, and now the Twins need to get one from Ploof. Taken low, ball one. When you're not scoring a lot of runs, there are at bats in games that are important and it's significant in your ability to uh, do the job you're supposed to do. Sam Fold hit the ball sharply with a runner on third, but didn't get him in. You have to get the guy in from third, especially when you're not scoring a lot of runs. And when you get your leadoff hitter on, you've got to get him in. Tattooed to left, but Deaza ranges over to make the catch. Booth hits a liner. For out number two, and that'll bring up Arcia. There's a look at the AT&T fan photo of the game. Tweet your photo, the hashtag North fan photo, for a chance to be shown in an upcoming game broadcast. Brought to you by AT&T. A couple of youngsters in the glove out on the plaza in right field. Good at bat by Trevor there. You can't guide the ball. All you can do with a runner on second base in a big situation we're talking about, you got to get that run in this inning when you get your leadoff hitter on. 
all you can do is hit the ball hard somewhere. You have a good at bat, get the pitch you want, hit it hard. He did all of those things. It was just right at the left field. Carroll has struck out Arcia twice on a total of seven pitches. Nearly to the backstop, ball one. He's thrown Arcia a steady diet of changeups, and so far as Waldo has just not been able to figure out the arm speed and the pitch speed on that changeup. He's really not seeing it well at all. What it's worth, I believe the rain has stopped here. Avi Guerra and Eric Serkamp warming up. Two and O. Oh. Nieto to the mound. His fifth win this year. He's been a swing guy. 11th start, six relief appearances. The Twins saw him out of the bullpen earlier this year. Two and zero. Oh. Tapper up the line. Two and one. Where a hitter has got to be really, really disciplined, and we'll see if Arcia can be that. It's three and one. He's got to get the pitch that he wants right here, or just absolutely forget about anything else. He's got to be very selective. He can't swing at a high fastball, can't swing at a low change. Get a fastball down where you like it. There's, that's a good take right there. It's a 79 mile an hour change up on three and one. He didn't, he was not looking for that pitch at all. He's going to make an out. If he swings at it. So now three and two. Now you go the other way. You say, okay, now he could throw me anything, and I've got to be defensive. I've got to be in the middle of the diamond, hit the ball back through the middle, and so I'm not vulnerable to any one pitch. Fourth, excuse me, third strikeout, and Arcia splitters his bat. Shards all over the grass and the dirt around home plate. Fold left at second, and the twins trail by a run. Need to play to win. It's a low scoring game, but they're down in our Grand Casino story of the game. Eduardo Escobar got the Twins off to a good start in the third inning with a double. 
on the ninth spot in the order, and Danny Santana followed with a triple. Twins unable to get Santana in, so it was a one nothing game at that point. Pino was Johan Pino pitching very very well for five innings, and then the big mistake, the three and one hanging breaking ball to Abreu, who drove in the game's second run in the sixth inning. And that's where we stand here as we go to the top of the seventh. White Sox up two to one. Jared Burton will pitch to the White Sox in the seventh inning as the Twins hand the game over to the bullpen. Been so few opportunities for the bullpen to protect a lead, but almost treat this like a lead. You're down by a run. You're still very much in the game, and so many times the bullpen's been called in with the Twins down four or five runs. Viciato to lead things off. Up the middle and a base hit on the first pitch from Burton. And that will bring up Connor Gillespie, who struck out twice against Pino. Carsoup.com trivia question. The last White Sox player to have four consecutive multi hit games against the Twins. I said Ventura. The answer is Alex Rios. Never would have got that. Yeah. Here's Gillespie. Up and away, ball one. Pichiedo, not much of a threat to steal. That's kind of a vulnerability that you have with Burton on the mound, but not in this case. Gillespie's hit into just three double plays this year. Marine comes down again. This one popped up. And Escobar giving way to Sam Full, blinking the, the rain drops away, making the catch one down. I'll bring up Deaza. Come on down, see a Twins game August 15th from Dozier's Deck. The special offer includes a Skyline Deck seat plus a limited edition. Brian Dozier camo t-shirt all for just thirty five dollars a portion of the proceeds will benefit pheasants forever's wildlife habitat conservation efforts call 833 twins ask for the special Dozier's deck ticket offer or visit twinsbaseball.com slash Dozier deck. Deaza with a single he got the first Chicago hit with two outs in the fifth and then was thrown out trying to steal. Strike one. I think you're thinking about this correctly, Dick. I, with a, in a one-run game with three innings to play, and the Twins being the home team having the last at bat, I think they have to look at this as uh, they have an advantage if, if it gets into a bullpen game. These last three innings. Harmony snags a line drive, steps on the bag, double play, inning over. Another nice play by Chris Parmley at first base.
Copyrighted telecast is presented by authority of the Minnesota Twins and may not be reproduced or retransmitted in any form. And the accounts and descriptions of this game may not be disseminated without the express written consent of Minnesota Twins, LLC. Fans follow every Twins game with MLB.com at bat on your favorite mobile phone or tablet. Get live look-ins, instant replay, scores, stats, audio, and the free MLB.tv game of the day. Download on the App Store or visit TwinsBaseball.com today. With uh, most of the fans standing here during seventh inning stretch, I want to give you a couple of numbers, one baseball-related, the other attendance-related. This year, as disappointing as the Twins' record has been, particularly as of late, uh, the Twins are right in the middle of the pack in terms of run score. Fifteen teams in the league, and the Twins are eighth. But to me, a more amazing number is this team has been struggling again on the field, particularly in the middle months. Right now, the Twins are seventh in the American League in attendance, and it's a testament to the loyalty of the fans. And we'll extend that to the viewership. And I know it's been a frustrating time for everybody, but I, I just uh, you can complain uh, justifiably about the product on the field, but. The Twins are blessed to have some extraordinarily patient and supportive fans. Very, very good baseball fans uh, here in, in Minnesota following the, the Twins. I, and I, I think it is a testament not only to the to the fans' patience, but also their understanding of where the Twins are in rebuilding this uh, ball club. And I will say, as disappointing as it has been to this point, it has been different than the last three years and, and especially in the, it, different than the last two in that it really has felt like that this Twins ball club has had a chance when they take the field has had a chance to win uh, every game that they were uh, that they were in when, when the game started and, and that has not been the case and I think the fans have come out with with better expectations this year. Ronald Belisario, the new pitcher for the White Sox. At one time, he was the closer for Chicago. First man he'll face, Josh Willingham. One for two with a single. White Sox out hitting the Twins 5-4, outscoring them 2-1. to one. Missing inside, missing outside, 2-0. Now, home plate umpire Jeff Kellogg is going to go out and have a word with Belisario. I might have heard some chatter from the Twins dugout, and I don't know what this is about, but we will watch very closely here. Asking for the glove to cover up the tattoos. That's what that's about. I was just having a discussion with somebody in the press box yesterday about that. I didn't think that. Players had to cover up their tattoos anymore, but we're told now it has some rosin on his arm. You can see all the powder above his glove on his left wrist. That's apparently he's going to leave the mound. I can't believe he's leaving the game. I think he's just going to get the rosin wiped off his wrist. I thought maybe so we're not gonna let me do that. I'm just gonna take the ball and go home. <laughs> and I, again, I just assume that somebody from the Twins dugout got the attention of Jeff Kellogg, also getting uh, rid of uh, a wristband, jewelry, or whatever. Well, the one thing that you can't do at, on the mound as a pitcher is have anything white or flashing on your uh, on your arms or any any part of your uh, upper body where it could distract the hitter from the from trying to pick up the, the white of the baseball. I'm sure that's what that is all about. Both the the rosin and the uh, little piece of jewelry, whatever that was. It just that was curious. You can't do that. That was a, that was a curious little episode. Yeah, it was. 2-0 to Willingham. 3-0. Armalee on deck. 
This was not a blotch of pine tar on Michael Pineda's neck. The Red Sox called the Yankees on that uh, way back in the uh, opening weeks of the season. This was apparently just some rosin on the wrist. And a four pitch walk to start the inning. Harmony will come up and Robin Ventura is going to come out and have a chat with Belisario. Catch every strikeout, every game ender, and every history making moment on MLB Whip Around weeknights at 9 p.m. Central on Fox Sports 1 and streaming live on Fox Sports Go. Rosario's walked the tying run on first, and now Parmley is at a warning track fly ball to right, and a medium deep fly ball to left. I wonder if Robin Ventura just wanted, instead of sending his pitching coach out there, if he wanted to go out there face to face with Belisario, say, "Look, is this is this going to be a distraction to you that they uh, that they called you on this? Are you going to be able to get back in the strike zone here?" I mean. I mean is this a problem or not? Tell me now. I got guys warming up. Here's Parmalee. And that's to left. And that's down for a hit. So five pitches into the outing for Belisario. The Twins have two runners on. The Chicago pitching coach Don Cooper is not with the team. Again, he's struggling with vertigo. Parmalee, we've seen him do this the, over the course of the last uh, several months. Parmalee's been much more open than ever, it seems, in using the whole field. Which is exactly what he did when he first came up as a rookie in uh, September. He came up and impressed us so much by his ability to hit the ball all over the ballpark. And he's been uh, swinging the bat very well here of late. See what Friars asked to do. Runners at first and second, I nobody out. i got to believe he's going to butt here. Squaring and taking one up and in it goes to the backstop and everybody will move up even better. And Belisario whether it the uh, move from Jeff Kellogg and we don't know that it came from the twins or not but something's gotten into his head. A four pitch walk was completed after the trip to the mound a base hit and then the next pitch nearly hit Fryer in the chin. Corner infielder still playing up. Why would they be doing that? Middle infielder's back, swinging a foul. I guess if the ball's hit there, they want to make sure Willingham doesn't score. But Willingham's not the fleetest of foot. Well, they just don't want at the corners. They just don't want to give up any a cheap run. They don't. They don't want to run scoring on a uh, on a slow uh, bouncing ball. They'll they'll accept it out in the middle of the infield. To prevent the runner on second from scoring, they'll accept a ground ball out there. But. Two and one. Fryer with one run batted in this year. And ideally, what Eric Fryer, if Eric Fryer could hit the ball to uh, the right side, the second baseman, he'd get one in and one over. He could tie the game and get the winning run to third base. That foul now two and two. Belisario, very, very tough pitcher to do that uh, against because of how much the ball sinks and runs in on right hand. It's hard to hit the ball over there. That would have been the ideal scenario for uh, Eric Fryer if he could have, if he could hit the ball up the middle or to the right side, get one in and one over with a, in, in one at bat. Two and two to Eric Fryer. Three and two. Fryer in his big league life has had just 69 at bats and driven in five runs. So you can make the case, I suppose, this, if he can get the job done here, would be the biggest RBI he's ever had. Tap foul, protecting the plate. Situation like this, it's it's tough. Right-handed sinker baller against a right-hand hitter, but the hitter's got to try to hit the ball back through the middle, which keeps him keeps him back. And if the ball's inside, it's just you just got to fight it off as best you can. And a foul ball between Scotty Elger and 
Josh Willing. Full count to Fryer. Escobar on deck. Takes a walk, and they're full up for the number nine batter. Very nice at bat by Eric Fryer right there. Very nice. And that'll be the end of the afternoon for Belisario. He walked two, gave up a hit. And whether there was some gamesmanship by the Twins to contribute to the start to this inning or whether it was Jeff Kellogg it doesn't matter the base is loaded nobody out. White Sox and read Tyler Mason's analysis. Get the latest from Vikings training camp and check out the latest top tweets from Minnesota area athletes. Uh, Bernanski giving Brian Dozier a crash course. Uh, Javi Guerra, the new Chicago pitcher. Sam Fold. So getting it might not be on uh, Guerra at all. Guerra brought in here to face Escobar and then another switch hitter Santana. Sir Camp, a left hander, continues to warm out in the bullpen. Tying run at third. Go ahead, run at second. Nobody out. And the White Sox have helped the Twins fill the bases here. We'll see what they can do to take advantage of the gift. Robin Ventura with a couple of pretty good options. Javi Guerra allowing uh, left handers to hit just 174 against them this year, and Sirkin about there in the bullpen 125 against against lefties. So with the switch hitters, Ventura going to Guerra because the right hander has good numbers against left hand hitters. And Escobar checks his swing. Ball one. Guerra throws hard straight over the top 93 to 95 or 6. He can get it up there pretty quickly. And so what's the battle? Swing and a miss with Escobar hoping to smash one against the fence in right again or over. It. He did that in the third with one out. He doubled off the fence in right and then scored shortly after that on Santana's triple also off the fence in right. One and one. Behind third, a short fly ball. Ramirez chasing it, making the catch, and Willingham can't tag. Well, Escobar fails to get the tying run in. And now Santana. Come on, come on, 
Escobar going after a high fastball there, and that's Javi Guerra's strength, it looks like to me. He throws straight over the top. Fastball has a lot of life, and that ball up in the strike zone to left hand hitters. I think that's probably one of the reasons he's successful against left handers. They tend to like the ball down in the strike zone, and high fastballs are not going to be the left hand hitter's most preferred pitch. Escobar chasing one he probably ought to have laid off of. And Santana goes after that first pitch breaking ball. Fox Tracks is presented by Carrier. Santana's put the ball in play three times. His RBI triple driving in the only run so far. And now two strikes. You can see why Guerra has had some stints as a closer. He's got he's got two very, very good pitches, a mid-90s fastball and a big breaking curveball. He throws both of those pitches right over the top and it changes eye angles. The ball comes out very high in the in uh, the release point and it, it that can be deceiving for both pitches. Open in. Games are won or lost in at bats like this. And the Twins have not done well with men in scoring position for several weeks now. We'll see if Santana, one of the least experienced hitters in the team, can come through here in the seventh. That's to right center field. Eaton with the catch. Willingham coming home and the throw not in time and off target. Willingham touches the plate. Santana gets the job done hitting it just deep enough to tie it up. Nieto, the catcher, tried to hold what ground catchers have left and try to catch the ball. Right, he tried to he tried to catch a tag at the same time as best he could, just couldn't pick the throw. It was up the line a little bit. It looks like he's going to be out if the throw is more on the plate, but. He couldn't come up with a uh, kind of a short heart pick and tag at the same time. Good job by third base coach Scotty Alger sending Willingham there. Willingham not the fleetest of foot, but you had to try it there. It's going to be the second out out there. You couldn't leave it to fold with two out. You had to give it a shot. Safe. They appeal Willingham left early. You know, I think we saw it the other day, but I'm sure we saw it here a year ago. The catcher Nieto is probably lined up in front of the plate to catch the ball and we have a collision. No question that's going to be a big collision too right there because of when the ball right. and Willingham arrived. But now catchers can't do that anymore. They can't block the plate without the ball. So Nieto had to try to try to make a play the catchers are still learning how to make and he tried to you know make the sweep tag catching the ball and tagging all in one motion. Yeah, but a year ago, that's not yeah. where he's lined up. Well, a year ago, he has to come up the line, catch that ball, and, and stand right in the line. Right. That's a big coll collision right there. Full fouls it back, one and one. I think this is a pretty good battle if uh, Sam Fold is uh, true to form here for Sammy. He's he's pretty good at laying off high fastballs for the most part. He. he Makes the ball be down in the strike zone. He, he's not over anxious on breaking balls. So I think this is a pretty good battle. I think Sam's got a chance here. Takes one over the inside corner, one and two. Two runners in scoring position, Harmony and Fryer. The leadoff walk has already scored the tying run. Foul. As I was saying before, just so important that, that fly ball by Danny Santana. I mean, it's so important to get that run in from third base with less than two out. When you're not scoring a lot of runs, you have to get the runs that they're going to give you without having to get a hit. You just have to get those. Off the plate, two and two. Sam was unable to get a, a guy in from third uh, earlier in the in the ball game in the third inning. 
with Santana on third. See if he can pick up a big run or two here with a two out hit. Up the middle, throw for a hit. Parmalee scores. Fryer coming in. Ball cut off. Fold thrown out at second, but both runs will score. The Twins get a two out hit. They take a 4 2 lead. And you're watching the Twins and White Sox brought to you by the all new Chrysler 200. Tomorrow, the Twins have a day off, but then they hit the road for a six-game trip, and it starts with three games in Kansas City. The Twins will take on the Royals, and we hope you'll join us Tuesday at 6.30 for Twins Live. But for now, back to Target Field and Dick and Roy. Right, thank you much. Roy will be with the Twins on the road trip as well, with Burp Lineliven and Cooper's down today, staying a little uh, extra. You are right on Sam Fold. He handled that like a guy who's been around for a while, a high fastball, didn't try to do too much of a with it with two strikes and just send it up the middle. And most importantly, he uh, laid off some pitches that would have been difficult for him to hit so that he could get one a little further down in the strike zone that he, that he was able to handle. Very, very professional at bat by Sam Fold. Two huge runs for the Twins. And Casey Fiend will come into the ball game now to try to protect a two run lead. Face Gordon Beckham, Adrian Nieto scheduled, and then Adam Eaton. Inside, ball one. Jared Burton faced just three men in the seventh. And Fiend hoping to have a nice, tidy eighth inning here. That's to center, Santana. Uh, down and out route in center field, but he got there. One down. We were talking about the great at bat that Sam Fold had, and against a guy throwing hard, that's the pitch you have to take. Too many guys will swing at that pitch, and he knows he can't handle that ball down a little bit more. You see how hard he's throwing. He gets the one and two. Now, this is a good battle right here. He fouls off that fastball. Watch the curveball. He lays off of that one. A lot of guys would have swung at that pitch, too. Finally gets a ball down in the strike zone and out over the plate that he can handle and wax it up the middle for a two run single. Two huge runs and a great professional at bat by Sam Fulton. Good job. All three runs charged to Belisario without retiring a batter. Now 1 and 0 oh to Adrian Nieto. One and one. And as soon as Fiend got the ball back from Eric Fryer, put his right foot up against the rubber. Let's go. Now outside two and one. Working quickly and throwing strike after strike after strike puts hitters uh, on the defensive and or at least allows them to be 
not as aggressive. It just is a better way to pitch if you can if you can get yourself to do it. That's it deep to left. Full sprinting to the corner. That's gone to the opposite field. Adrian Nieto's first major league home run. A left handed batter hitting one to the opposite field. And it's a 4 3 ball game. And I think shocked everybody. This is not that bad a pitch. It's out over the plates, away, but up a little bit. Don't know much about Nieto, but. All of a sudden we find out he's got some power in the opposite field. I would not have thought that he would as a left handed batter take that pitch from Casey Fien and be able to hit it to seats to the left field. Missing up high to Eaton. Red Sox got two in the six. Now one so far here in the eighth. Nice silent treatment there by his by his by his teammates. He comes in. Look, the manager says congratulations, but and the coaches, but nobody else says. Everybody just sitting there. He's wondering what the heck. Isn't anybody watching? And finally, they got up. You know, hugs all around. He was an A ball last year. He got to get a better treatment. No, that. that's that's exactly why they did it. Look, nobody's talked to him yet. Anyway, he knows it's coming. <laughs> You know that's a sign of a pretty loose ball club too, right? Right there, they can be down four to two and now get back in the game four to three. Still down four to three and, and still play the silent treatment game. Slap foul. Well, earlier we had Luke Edwards on. He was the 12-year-old in the movie who ended up managing the Twins, uh, fictionally of course, 20 years ago. And one of his quotes in the movie is he addresses the team as, "Hey guys, let's just have fun." And uh, it's hard to do that when you're not winning. And it really it's a, it, the cart and the horse argument, I suppose, can apply too, but it's just outside two and two. Gardenhire said it on his uh, radio show. This isn't fun for anybody. You know, the White Sox have come in here, won three in a row, and the White Sox are all loosey goosey and having fun, and even though they're down on the scoreboard, two and two. And another one lifted foul. It is so hard to have fun when you're not winning, when you're not hitting, whatever, whatever it is. It's, and it is a chicken and egg deal. But I, I really believe that if a if a player, and I, and I know this now by experience, rather than uh, it, this is more of a do as I say, not as I do, uh, or as I did. But it, if a player can just force himself to just enjoy it, every aspect of the game, even when it's bad. The bat's not going to last as long. It's going to be easier to take. It won't last as long. I really, I really believe that. It's, it's just so hard to do. It's so hard not to allow yourself to, to, not have fun if things aren't going the way you'd like them to go. Long battle here now for Eaton. We won't see many at bats like this with Fien on the mound. Tapper to short. Escobar waits for the second up. Fires and gets eaten by a less than a full step. Man, that guy's fun to watch fly down the line. Two down. That's a routine two hopper straight away to shortstop, and it's very, very difficult to imagine making the play this close. There's a bounce, bounce, strong throw, just barely nipping. Two down, and now Alexei Ramirez. Ramirez, a sacrifice fly, his last time up. Tried to tie it up, missed the cutter. And missed it because it was on the outside corner and, and continuing to break away. If that ball starts on the inside part and breaks to the middle, that's right in Ramirez's wheelhouse. So Casey's going to have to be very, very deliberate about getting it out there. Shaving the corner. With the four seamer. It's 0 and 2. Good pitch there. Got to believe that uh, Ramirez is expecting Fiend to try to stay away. 
Ramirez ever ready on the ball from middle in. He's on the speed. It's fastball cutter. It's not going to be anything a whole lot slower. So he's on the speed. This is all about location. Good pitch. Bluff charges. Fires on the run. Inning over. A one out home run from a guy who doesn't even have 100 at bats in his big league career. It's a one run game. Jose Abreu put the White Sox ahead in the six, two to one, with that double down the left field line. Twins came back in the seventh. Sam Full with a great at bat, two runners on, put the Twins back in front, four to two. And then in the top of the eighth, with Casey Fiend pitching, Adrian Nieto, opposite field blast, to get the White Sox back within one. We go to the top of the ninth. Well, I'm sorry, the bottom of the eighth. With the Twins up four to three. I'm jumping ahead to uh, a uh, presumed Perkins save in the uh, top of the ninth. But let's hope the Twins add some insurance here at the bottom of the eighth. Against Daniel Webb, the guy we saw last night, who's got a nice arm. I like this guy's stuff. Throws hard. Got a hard, hard breaking ball. Fourth Chicago pitcher of the afternoon. Perkins will get the ninth, whether it's a one-run lead or an eight-run lead. Have an off day tomorrow. Burke got kind of a tune up inning in last night's game. Dozier 0 for 3. Bluff 0 for 3. Arcio 0 for 3 with three strikeouts. So that's the lineup that Webb will have to face here. And then they're all due. Inside, ball one. Foul, one and one. Twenty seven thousand eight eighteen the paid attendance today. High to center field. Eaton with the sunglasses on. One down. Let's go to Marty Gellner. Dick, coming up after the game is it is every game. We'll bring you Twins Live presented by CenturyLink. And today we'll look at a late inning rally for the Twins who picked up three big runs in the seventh inning. Also a strong start from Johan Pino who went six innings, gave up four hits to the White Sox, but gave the Twins a chance to win, which is what Gardy was looking for tonight. We'll hear from that man, Ron Gardenhire, coming up on Twins Live after the game. Thank you. Second uh, good start for Pino against the White Sox. Strike one to Ploof. Ploof with a pop to second, bouncer to short, liner to left. Last at bat, he just crushed the ball right within range of Diaz. Fouled back, two strikes.
Trevor a little frustrated there fouling that ball back. He got a pitch that he wanted and thought he should handle and fouled it back. That's what happens when you're not swinging the bat great. You're in just a little bit of a down downturn. You just don't hit the pitches that you ought to hit. That's then you have to swing at pitches like that, which are impossible to hit. Off speed pitch way out in front, a little pop up, two down. Off day for the Twins tomorrow, and then our Chrysler 200 to road ahead. Three in Kansas City, three in Chicago. Home just long enough to unpack and repack, then to the West Coast in Houston. The Royals come here, in the middle of the month. Unfortunately, the Twins' home record and road record uh, virtually the same. Twins 23 and 29 at home now, and 23 and 28 on the road. Arcia takes a strike. He's already struck out three times. He has a new bat because after he took a call third strike in the sixth, he shattered the old one over his knee. Well, put it in play weakly to first, and Abreu makes the play. Glenn Perkins will have a one run lead to work with in the ninth inning. Save in the All Star game in front of his hometown fans and family. And the hope was in the 10 game homestand that followed, he'd get another half dozen save opportunities. It hasn't worked out. Perkins has converted the two save opportunities he's had so far, and he'll get another one here this afternoon. And it's a big one here today. Twins need this ball game very, very badly. And this is the guy that they call on to close her out. He's been terrific. All star season. And he needs to be very, very good against this guy. This is the bat of the, the at bat of the game right here. Against Abreu, Jose Abreu. The first man face Perkins. Check swing inside ball one. Abreu doubled in the short term go ahead run in the sixth. Driving a breaking ball into the corner. Low. It will be Abreu, then Canerco, and VC8. Three very dangerous right handed batters. Big swing and a miss. Canerco's faced Perkins twice this year in a pinch hitting capacity. And single both times. Two.
Two and one. Fouled back two and two. Two good fastballs in a row there up and out over the plate by Perkins. Tough to get to those pitches out there up and out there 94 95 miles an hour. Has him set up for the back foot slider if he wants or another another fastball out on the outside part of the plate. Driven to the right field corner foul. When you see a guy and this is the. This is the tough part about pitching to a real good hitter. When you see a guy like this is laid on your fastball, it's easy to say, well, I can't throw him a breaking ball because he's that'll just speed up his bat. For Perkins, if he throws a good one down at the back foot, that can be a good pitch, even though the guy's late. That was a slider, but it was left out yep. over the plate. Yeah, that's not the one he wants. Just a, a breaking ball strike here would speed up Abreu's bat. And make it a more of a uh, pitch that he could handle. The one he wants, if he wants to throw a slider, is the one to his back foot. Try to get a strikeout on a on a ball. Otherwise, you keep you keep pounding him with those fastballs. There it is. Jack swing. That's a great that's a great take. And the reason he's able to take that pitch is because he's hitting the ball way back, the fastball way back on the on the plate. Here's we look at the slider. Most every right hander after seeing those fastballs is going to swing at that pitch. Abreu didn't because he's waiting a long time. He's willing to be late on the fastball. Breaking ball hammered to left. Third straight slider. And Abreu starts the inning with a single. Yeah, that's the one I don't think that we wanted to see. The, the slider for a strike was going to speed up, do exactly what happened right there, speed up his bat. So here's what I'm talking about with uh, with Abreu. When you're throwing the ball as hard as Perkins is, and he's obviously behind. That's a good pitch inside, just missed, and he misses here two and all. He comes right back with fastballs though, in the strike zone, and Abreu is late. He's late on that one. He's late on that one. Fouls him back. He's late on that one. Fouled down the right field line. He's really late. Now that was a dangerous slider right there because it was up and out over the plate. That's the good one. That's his strikeout one. Now you have to go back to fastball. The breaking ball strike is he's just going to hit because he's not going to be fooled by the speed. Bring you lifted for a pinch runner, Leury Garcia. And now Canerco will hit for Dunn. Canerco's facing Perkins twice in the ninth inning this year and delivered a single each time on the first pitch each time. Throw him a different one then. Ball one. Canerco, prior to yesterday when he got a start, when Logan Darnell made uh, the start for the Twins, a left hander, Canerco had been limited to pinch hitting duties against the Twins, and he was three for four in those pinch hitting opportunities, two for two against Perkins. Three for three. And Garcia is going to try for third and he'll advance the tying run 90 feet away. And now Canerco, who's just owned Perkins this year for whatever reason, drops another ninth inning single into the outfield against Perkins. Good fastball in on him. He got down toward the label, but strong enough to muscle the ball over the shortstop's head. Didn't hit it hard. Perkins made a pretty good pitch. Canerco's just right now in a good streak against against Perkins. Three straight at bats. Sierra will run for Canerco. Now Diane V. Sierra, the only bench player left after this flurry of moves by Robin Ventura, is Tyler Flowers. V. Sieto against Perkins, five for nine, a double, a triple, and three straight hits. Left hand hitting Connor Gillespie on deck. One's playing for a double play grounder here. And he gets ahead of his first batter of this ninth inning.
Perkins reaching back and blowing a fastball right by VC Ada. One down. BC Ada was thinking I, what I was thinking. He's going to get another fastball. Yeah, that's two great pitches in a row in, in that sequence. Just a great, great strikeout slider right there. And their century link link to what's next opening night Kyle Gibson will go for the twins James Shields will go for the Royals Twins would like to get there with a win under their belt lefty against lefty Gillespie against Perkins breaking ball over for a called strike Gillespie 0 for 3 against Perkins last time he faced him Gillespie bounced into a double play. So it can be done. Oh, and two. On deck, I'm sure we'll see flowers if if Perk can get uh, Gillespie here. Foul back of the piece. Flowers would be the last man off the bench. Ready to go. One and two to Gillespie. Two and two. the slider. Abreu laid off a tough pitch and then got a base hit. Now Gillespie from the left side lays off that breaking ball. Yeah that was a very good take by a lefty who hasn't hit lefties well this year under 200 against lefties for Gillespie. Full count with one down. Sierra has some pretty good speed at first. Perkins needs to at least be aware of him. Walk him. And they're loaded up with one down. And now, Piazza will come to the plate. Pair of singles, a strikeout. Perkins had Gillespie 0 and 2, and then ended up walking him. Diazza will hit with the corner infielders playing in. Diazza hit an 083 against left-handers. I'm just, I'm really surprised. The only thing I can figure is that there's uh, nobody going in the outfield other than Flowers if he hits for Diazza, but it just. Strike one. Deaza against Perkins, two for seven. Seems to me like you got to try to win the game here, but we'll see how it plays out. Oh, and two.
beyond that. 083 against lefties, 60 at bats, and 20 strikeouts. Oh, and two to Deaza. Out of peace. Perkins with 23 pitches thrown, still only one out on the board. Territory and back into the seats. in the dirt he was able to block it and make the tying run from scoring very nice block by Eric fire hard slider in the dirt there Diazza has no chance fire keeps it in front of him that would have been that's a very very big block and here's what I'm talking about basically with Diazza going up there with one out you're basically putting on Gordon Beckham's shoulders with two out High ball one Beckham five for 15 against Perkins. Infield back at normal depth. Hall oh, strike at the belt. Beckham thought that was as high as the first one. Coming into this series, really struggling at the plate. Hit a double in the sixth inning and scored a run. Struggling mightily against right handers, but hit swinging the bat pretty well against lefties. Down the left field line, Sam Fold with a long run, a slide, but the ball landing in foul territory, and Fold springs up. Wow. Had it been a fair ball, Fold might have caught it. But it was a foul ball. He might have caught it, and it would have been one terrific play had he done that. He would just barely got to the line in time. You will see it right here, an all-out sprint. If that ball lands fair, he's got a real good chance of catching it, but it's going to be a real good play if he does. One and two to Gordon Beckham. Screen of the Chicago dugout. 30 pitches for Glenn Perkins. Another nice block by Fryer. Almost identical blocks on identical pitches there. Two consecutive hitters. And now you're starting to run out of a little bit of room if you're Glenn Perkins. Two and two count. Don't want to go to three and two. Hook down the line. Foul. Just a little reflection on the block. That ball landed in the middle of the batter's box. That's about as uneven a territory as there is on the baseball field. So it's not like it's, you know, out in front of home plate where you're going to get a flat bounce. There he's pretty chewed up. Especially with the ball, the slider spin on right. the ball, too. It's, it's just two really nice plays by Eric Fryer. Two and two to Beckham. 
to left center field. Fold has it called for. Measured, fought the sun. And the Twins win the finale. They avoid getting swept by the White Sox for the first time in Minnesota in a four-game series. It wasn't easy. Perkins loaded the bases. And it looked for all the world as if Sam Fold was squinting the entire time that ball sailed into his glove. That was not as easy to play as it looked like it was going to be when it left the, the bat. It wasn't an easy inning as we thought it was going to be for Glenn Perkins, but he gets the job done, and the Twins get a much, much needed victory. Tom Hannum and the Twins went into this homestand hoping for bare minimum, 7-3 homestand, and instead they had to win the final game to make it a 3-7 and seven homestand. But they salvaged the final game of this disappointing series, erased some of the aftertaste of what was a lost weekend with a victory today. Up next on Twins Live, we'll break it all down, including Johan Pino's strong start. We'll hear from Guardy next.